Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss how, to data, how do data governance and data architecture support each other. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to know the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And now let me introduce to you the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Always a pleasure to do these. Glad to see some familiar faces on the call. Um, for those of you who might be new to this data architecture series, it is a series. Um, one of the questions we get most commonly is, are these recorded? The answer is yes. Uh, Dataversity keeps all of these on their website, so you can go back if you missed any. Um, if this is your first time on the series, we also have some other coming up this year. So Happy if you can join us on some of these others, because if you like data architecture and data, this is the place we have a monthly chat about data. But today we're going to talk about data and its overlap with data governance. And why I like this topic, it is it's a common question I get. Um, so as, as Shannon mentioned in, in my bio, I, I run a consultancy global data strategy and we we do a lot of this in practice. And what I try to add to these webinars is stuff that we see in the real world. And this is one of the most common questions. You know, what is data governance, data architecture, data management? You could put that in there. Are they really the same thing with different names? How do they relate? And it's a valid question, especially if you're not a, a data person and you're on the business side and this is brand new to you because you know the, the nuance is, is subtle in some cases, but they are different things and they do support each other. Um, so I'll kind of cover that on the webinar of, of where they're different, where they have overlap, and, and how really they're, they, they support each other when done effectively. So I um, always like to come to these data uh, sessions with data. Um, so Dataversity and, and Global Data Strategy each year do a survey. I think the survey is out now, if I'm not incorrect. Um, and it's always fun to see the results because generally the results improve over time. And one of them is, do you have a current data governance in place or are just in the process of implementing one? And this is one that used to be a lower number and now it's about 88%. And so, and I'm seeing this in my day job as well. Many more companies that maybe didn't look at governance in the past because of the new exciting things, partly like AI and machine learning and analytics and wanting to be data driven, you're realizing you can't do that without data governance. So probably not a surprise to people on this call that the majority of companies, and, and to be fair, this was the data diversity survey. So maybe self-defining that people are already interested in data. Um, the other one I liked is the you know, slightly slower uh, sh lower number, but was pleased to see it, which is that 35% where folks saw improved collaboration through using a defined data architecture. Now, for me, that's not surprising and it's it's nice to see I think a lot of folks kind of maybe scratch their head, wait, data architecture is a collaboration tool? And I see in our practice, absolutely, things like a conceptual data model or even things like data catalog and glossary, right? Those, those are data architecture artifacts, but they really help that communication uh, between the business and you know, more of a technical data architecture role. So I, I think throughout this uh, presentation, we'll, we'll give you a, a few examples of that and how that handshake really sort of works. So. Um, went back to the good old-fashioned uh, DM Bach, a data management body of knowledge. If you're not familiar with that, the Data Management Association, or DEMA, or DAMA, depending on where you live, um, has a uh, body of knowledge that is very helpful as a starting point. Um, if, if, if you're new to this, it gives some really good definitions. So I'll take theirs. So data governance, uh, what I like about their definition, I think it shows the reality, is the authority and control and shared decision making. Um, and, and when I kind of talk about this in my presentations, I call it almost the yin and yang. It's kind of the, the both, right? You have to have that authority and control. 
but it's not like I had one client and he said, I'm so excited to be the data governance manager. I get to tell people what to do now. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, Mike. <laughs> anyone who's had kids or anyone, you know, even in the military, you can't just tell people what to do and everyone just gladly, you know, without any context or any sort of um, input, right? Um, so I think you need to, to balance that with that idea of shared decision making, getting people together to make decisions and have that balance because you can't just have everyone making their own decision either, right? Then that's there's no governance whatsoever. So finding that balance is a challenge. Now, data architecture on the other side, um, what I, I highlighted some of the things I liked about their definition as well. One of them is that idea that it's representing organizational data at different levels of abstraction so that it can be understood. Of course, because I'm a data architect, I thought of data models right away. You know, this idea of a business level data model that gets to the thing, you know, what's a customer, what's a product, um, which are still very helpful um, versus maybe a technical data model that can be really detailed. And we'll go through that, right? And the other part, um, and I didn't include the whole definition here, but you know, that it has these specific artifacts that are used to describe data and the requirements um, and, and, and how we like to describe it, you know, the, the, the business should define, you know, what, what you need and then the data architects can, can implement the how, right? Right. That the business knows what a customer is and we know what the valid values are, but really, really it takes that data architect to translate that into actual physical structures. And that's why it's really a partnership between data governance that gets those business requirements um, and, and the nuance behind it and data architecture that builds these artifacts that makes it real and, and implements it. So we'll, we'll give some examples and talk through that. If you've been on my webinars before, um, you'll you'll have seen this diagram. We use this a lot in our, our practice because it's it, it's sort of a you know loosely based off of the DM box, but it really shows for us you know what a data strategy is. But a big part of that, you know, the, the business strategy part up top is why are we even doing this? Which is not a, a wrong question to ask, right? There's a lot of data you can manage. How do we prioritize? How do we focus on the right things? How you do that is through that second row, which is your data governance and your, and your collaboration, getting the right people and the right culture of asking those questions. Um, oh gosh, I was just, we were at we a client site today and we were just explaining this concept um, in a meeting this morning and we just, someone had an issue with, with I don't know, it was, it was doing, you know, what, what calendar, what work weeks are. Um, and someone said, well, of course we know that. It's Monday through Friday. And they said, oh, no, wait a minute. Someone in the meeting said, no, 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 the, 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 admin, the tech folks, they work weekends. So it just, you know, and someone else said, well, other, other groups only work Monday through Thursday. So what's a work week? Something as simple as what a work week is just organically had a really great discussion. And we said, that's what governance is all about. Something, you know, there's no magic in that. It's not like you were forcing people to find one or the other, just to be very clear because it's going to affect your, your bonus and the, you know, how you calculate salary and all of that. So getting those folks in a room and then having IT support. Well, when we calculate it, we will only include certain days, right? That might be a formula in your data transformation. So that that's really that part at the bottom, um, whether it's master data, data warehousing, data quality, data architecture, security, metadata, all of that, and, and where it's stored. Is it in a database? Is it in the spreadsheet, et cetera? All of those bottom layers are really where you need architectural support and it's governance which is kind of that that sandwich <laughs> layer in between what the business is trying to do and how it can support it and, and that's really where the data architecture comes in um like with anything i think using a structured framework helps really set the stage if nothing else it's a great checklist for really what we need to do um this is our our framework we'll give you some tidbits from that but it's probably common across you know all, all the a lot of folks probably look at something similar. The most important one is your vision and strategy. Why are you doing this? What business problem is this solving? What business value is this adding, right? Um, and then the, the bottom, you know, the foundation is that culture and communication. Does everyone bought in? Does everyone understand? Do we have a data-driven culture, right? Um, and then, you know, the, the pillars of the house or the walls, I guess you could call it. One is organization and people. Do we have the right people in the right roles? Um, you know, do do we have the right data stewards in place that are able to provide the right decisions, and are they supported by a data architecture team um, that can that can drive that and implement that in systems? Um, and I've seen across a lot of clients sometimes that's unbalanced. Sometimes there's a tech team and they don't know who to go to to get the right answers to their questions. How do you calculate work week? I shouldn't be defining this. I've heard that so many times from tech teams. I'm defining these business rules that I shouldn't be defining. I need something in place, but I don't know who to ask. Right? Or similarly, sometimes. It's the business people that say, I need this stuff done and I shouldn't be doing it. I don't know how to write ETL. I just need my report and Power BI. And that's really hard for me to do. Can someone just do this for me, right? So you got to get that balance. 
process and workflows, the second column there, or second wall of the house. Um, there's business processes that support data, right? When you're doing your day-to-day -day business process, you're typing in data, that's that's data stewardship, really. Uh, but then there's also data governance or data management processes. How do I create that definition of what a standard work week is, right? Where do I document that? How do I, if I don't agree with the definition, who do I tell, right? That's a basic uh, process that's part of governance. And then data management and measures, which really you could say is the data architecture. How, how am I both measuring the data quality or measuring, what, what is that famous uh, line? You can't manage what you can't measure. Um, well, if, if you don't have a good sense of the quality of your data or where it is and where it's stored, you really can't be managing that effectively, right? So um, that that's really, you could say, the data management or data architecture practice. Um, and then the tools and platforms to support that. So um, we'll touch that lightly. I have come from a vendor space. I used to be a vendor developing tools myself, but I, I would say please answer that question too, too often. People say, oh, great, we need to do data governance, what catalog do we buy or what tool do we buy? A question you need to answer, but that shouldn't be the first question you ask, right? Do we have everything else in place? Do we have the vision? You know, I've, I've seen people get a catalog and scan in thousand of elements and they say, why, what are you using that for? I don't know, but this tool could do that. <laughs> and we have 20,000 elements in there, but who's looking at it? And so you're know, really getting that vision and strategy and organizing the people process data and tools around that and then getting that culture built. Really, you need to do all of these as you go. Um, so this next slide is an eye chart. I'm not going to read through it, uh, luckily, um, but it really gives you a sense of when you, you know, what do we mean by a vision and strategy? Do we understand how it's supporting the business? What do we mean by organization and people? It isn't just the data stewardship, right? It's, you know, people have the right training. Do we know who the, you know, all across the board? So I'll, this is just really a slide for reference as you go through and you want to maybe look at this later. I'll, I'll leave that for your reference. Um, so we're going to kind of go through each section of this framework and it'll kind of think answer the question of how data governance and data architecture fit uh, each other you'll see the little icon in the upper left that's kind of the, the area of the house we're talking about so we're talking about people and process uh, the people and organization not process it's a different wall um and and i won't go through this in detail i think there's plenty of other webinars on um, data diversity that cover what's the data owner versus the data steward or executive sponsor. Um, but I think suffice it to say that the, then the, the folks up top, the executive sponsors and the data owners and the data stewards, they understand the business or the organization. You could be a nonprofit, you could be a hospital, right? But you understand how that organization runs and you know the business rules of what a standard work week is or what a customer is or how we define our product hierarchies, all of that. Um, and then a technical data steward, maybe they understand the systems, right? I'm, I'm looking at my customer data is, and that's in, um, you know, the CRM and, and there's certain rules around that. That is the reality, right? So the business data stewards and the technical data stewards should work really closely together so that that CRM, as an example, or your ERP or your marketing system is implementing the rules in the right way that reflect your business. I've seen too many people um, buy a tool and it doesn't quote work because the business rules, the data centric business rules in that system don't align what they're trying to do. So yeah, I had one very successful client that went to the vendor with their data model and said, prove to us that your tool matches our data model. It actually worked. Um, they were actually able to get some implementation changes at purchase time to make I mean, something as simple as can a customer have uh, more than one address or can an order have more than one invoice? I mean, all of these things I'm, I'm bringing up because I've caused pain and suffering to clients that didn't define this early and, and the number of business problems that can be solved by any of those that are caused and not solved by those questions. And, and that's really where you need the architects and the business people working together. So the foundation of a data governance, I kind of briefly talked about those roles, is both the data governance lead and the enterprise data architect. And to me, they should work hand in hand, be best of friends and support each other. Um, so whereas those business roles, I mean, you are a data owner, uh, or a data steward because you work in the business. You you might be a finance person, you might be a teacher, you might be whatever it is um, because you know the business. You're that subject matter expert with extra responsibility and accountability um, for this area of the business. You need a data governance lead to collaborate and coordinate, um, but a data governance lead should know enough technology to be able to drive it and understand it. They should know what a glossary is and they should know what a data model is and what data lineage is they really shouldn't have to be building 
the data models and the data lineage and data quality dashboards and things. Generally, there's a team, but the leader of that team is some sort of enterprise data architect, right? And they should work together. Maybe the data government leads facilitate workshops around defining a data model, but really it's the architect building that model, if that makes sense. So um, sometimes they're the same person. Uh, typically though, you really, those are different roles, um, but work together. Think of the data governance lead as that business lead uh, championing the effort and the data architect is really running the architecture or the implementation of that. So that's the beauty of data governance. There's something in it for everybody. And I I know like we do a lot of hiring and, and you have to be really clear, you know, one side of data governance really is that people, so, I mean, all of it has to do with people when you're at the governance, right? But there's the, I wanna collaborate meetings. I wanna be a champion for change. You know, often the data governance lead turns into the chief data officer role, right? Because you're the one working across groups, you're facilitating, you know, sometimes, project managers turn into really good data governance leads um, because one client said it and I love their quote, so I'll steal it. It was, I want someone that can tell people what to do and people still like them. <laughs> you know, and a good project manager does that too. You're, you're harnessing the horses, but um, you're getting them to run at the same time. So there is that kind of touchy feely people side. Um, and there's also folks that, Hey, I love creating databases or, or doing data quality checks. I mean, I've got some folks in my team and I love them because they no, love nothing more than profiling data and finding inconsistencies and, and doing data quality rules or, you know, re really getting into some of that, like that would be hell for somebody else, right? That detailed nerdy techie folks. Um, at the same time, someone that maybe really loves doing data quality profiling and doing statistics on how many social security numbers are off, um, you know, are, are, are not standard or how many empty last name fields they are might drive somebody else crazy who wants to really work with people and do trainings and things like that. So it is a team. Uh, so there's something for everyone and something that someone probably hates, right? That, that is why it's a team and that's why you need a framework. And I think that's, um, I didn't mean to make the tech a devil. <laughs> I just think a lot of folks don't like tech. I do. Um, but those to be the kind of the yin and yang working to, together. Um, and that's where I, I think that the architect, a true good enterprise data architect should understand the business and be a bit of a people person um, because, because you really need to understand the business and also do tech. But it's it's a extreme example to kind of show that case. There's a lot of parts of governance and, and hire appropriately <laughs> uh, or you'll get the wrong person for the wrong role. Um, so that really is the purpose of this. And this is, a, I think I built this slide because we get this question a lot. Um, and, and the other thing, just like tools and vendors and everything else, we as an industry love to change names of things and then make it even more confusing. You know, is it a data engineer or a database administrator? And what's this, a cloud data engineer, right? But there are types of roles that it's a, it's a spectrum, right? So, um, and, and within each, and maybe this is a bit of an eye chart, but what it's trying to say on the left, the CIO or the CEO or the CFO, um, those are going to be the, the high level vision. Are we moving to the cloud? Are we gonna use um, AI and machine learning? Are, do we need an enterprise data warehouse to do financial reporting, right? The, the, or the P&L, how much funding do we have? That's really gonna be your left, your, your high level vision, right? As, and and if, if you sort of go from left to right, um, who's going to do the, the business requirements, right? That might be your data architect, your enterprise architect, your data modelers, and then the data owners or the data governance lead are going to help define what you need to do. And then some of the artifacts are some of those black bullets that we have, you know, a conceptual data model might be some of the core business requirements. Um, what do we even mean by a customer? Is it a retail customer? Is it a wholesale customer? Is it a you know, cut, lapsed customer, you know, all of those different definitions, um, doing some business process modeling, understanding the customer journey or the student journey or the patient journey, uh, how data is used, right? If you're kind of then getting into some of the data landscape, right? So what is the system architecture and how the data flows together and what technology we use for that? You're probably getting into more of a data architect, solution architect. Um, where is that database stored? Uh, do we need to start to create uh, some data models? That's maybe more your data architect, maybe kind of going into the data engineer because we're starting to get more into a physical model. And maybe that's where your data stewards are, right? So where a data owner might be at kind of a high level. Are we talking about our wholesale customers or our retail customers for this project? 
a data steward is going to get into the different rules of you know, how do we store first and last names or family names for customers or what are the business rules for a work week, right? They're really going to get into more of those details. And that's where the data architects, data modelers are going to start implementing that. As you start to execute that into actual platforms, you're going to have data engineers, data integration, ETL uh, uh, developers. And then as you go to the right, that is really where I'm getting into actually building databases or data platforms, your data engineers, your DBAs. And then on, on the full on to the right, um, there's folks that do the platform. I mean, who's going to set up the cloud data platform or de 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 decide are we using AWS or Azure or Snowflake or you know how they fit together and, and really keep that platform running? That's going to be your platform infrastructure. So I know that was a, a word cloud and a whole lot of things, but this has been helpful to folks to kind of see where people fit. You know, I've heard I've heard everything because this is hard. It can be complicated. You know, I, I knew I needed to do governance. Should I hire a data engineer? Maybe, but that's probably not the first thing to start with for governance. It's probably an architect and a data governance lead, and then you need to find the business to do that, right? So, but it will show that you can't um, build build all of this without a team of efforts, and they all have their own place. And I've made this mistake because I love it all, and I expect everyone else to love it all. But you know, don't don't get your data engineer up in a workshop trying to define what a customer is. They'll probably roll their eyes and like, I need to start writing some code, right? And and similarly, don't ask your high-level conceptual data model enterprise architect to start writing, you know, ETL. I mean, of course, there's unicorns that can do everything, or in a smaller company, you have to, but it's kind of um, a different skill set for each one. So um, the other part of the house uh, that we kind of talked about is, is that idea of process, and that's the little icon on the upper left, of process and workflow, and even this is a kind of a mix of both business and technical. So if I start at the lower left, the dark blue, um, I think this is under, uh, not looked at enough, um, that, that really data is driven by business process, right? That's where your data stewardship comes in. If the invoice number is wrong, it's the person putting the invoice in. So often, and, and maybe it's human nature, we'll do a data governance assessment and folks say, great, we have data quality issues. IT is going to fix that. Uh, IT can support that. IT can build some, or IT being architecture and data, the data techie data folks, um, they can build some data quality profiling and help you understand, but they, you don't want them putting the invoice number in, or right, or the uh, the customer name. Maybe that's sales. Maybe it's billing. You know, who defines the customer address or all of that, right? That's a business thing. You know, IT can help validate addresses through the postal service or something like that, but somebody needs to talk with the customer, and, and it's probably, I bet sales doesn't want IT talking about some of the customer data, right? That's their customer. So a lot of the data quality is and can and should be managed at the business level or the, you know, it's the patient's diagnosis. People in IT putting that in, I hope the doctor's putting that in. Um, and there's certain procedure codes that the doctor needs to put in and that's data governance. Those are valid values. Those are referencing, right? Um, there's certain, if I go kind of around clockwise, those data governance operations might be, well, let's pick that example. I'm a, I'm a doctor and I diagnose someone and I want to put in the right diagnosis code. Um, and that code doesn't exist. Who, how do I log an issue to say I need that right valid value, right? Or I'm a salesperson and there's different types of customers and the drop down list is not there. Or I have a customer in, I don't know, um, Puerto Rico and that's not in the drop down list. There's only US states and, and I need to add Puerto Rico to the drop down list. Who do I go to? That's a data governance operation of how do I log an issue or I see I don't trust the data there's some data quality issues can we create a, create a work group to solve it that that's data governance data management you know how do I define that the correct data definition or, or who who how do we implement some of those uh, business rules into how, how do I implement those drop down lists of states into the valid values of inputs right so all of those need to work together across to, to really solve that those issues. So um, another bit of an eye chart a little bit, but there are certain artifacts that are or deliverables um, for each area. Some of them are totally business centric. You know, what are the goals and vision? How do I prioritize what to do? Um, what are the definitions of my business terms and glossaries? That's a purely business thing. They should define those. On the technical side, you know, what tools we use, what physical data models and platforms and naming standard data types and things, those well, maybe not data types could be shared, but the, the, those are technical things, right? You don't want the business defining the platforms, right? They can define the budget, but tech needs to handle tech, business needs to handle business. And then there's certain things that are absolutely shared, 
right? Um, the business rules, right? The, the business defines them, the, the tech folks can help implement them, the data models, the business people understand the rules, but you need an architect to actually build the model or, or facilitate that session. Similarly, a data catalog, I mean, I've seen it both ways, but you, you can have the business people defining the rule, the terms in that data catalog, but there is a technical maintaining of that platform, how you organize it, how you publish it out. Um, retention rules, that's another great one. Do we store, probably several people in the org have different opinions on that from legal to, to sales to finance of how long I need to retain the data. Business defines, you know, or legal says we need to keep this, you know, data for seven years and no more than seven years. That's a business rule, but IT is the one that's actually either going to archive or delete or maintain that. So that kind of shows that, you know, governance holistically is, is both certain things the business owns, certain things tech owns, and there's a whole bunch of that kind of purple stuff in the middle um, that really needs to be a shared handshake. And that's where the infrastructure, those roles of governance, you all need to work together. So um, it can seem overwhelming. That's a whole lot of stuff. You could say, hey, I'm, I'm a small nonprofit or I'm a, I'm a big company with a small budget. I, I can't or just everyone has, doesn't have a lot of time. Where do I start? Um, and so this gets into the data management. And we've had a lot of success with just pick, pick a subject area, pick a work group and build just enough data um, management artifacts around that. Um, so we had one. This is a um, fictitious insurance company. Uh, but based off a real world example, they wanted to know how do we how do we best price our policies um, to support our customers so we can have the best best uh, data for that. So we made a little data model, which just had you know is it brokers and customers and policies and claims and and then we did a small business process model for how that data gets through. Did a data architecture diagram. What were the business rules around that? One of them was, can we use credit score? Is it allowed to use credit score? Is it legal? Who can see the credit score, right? And that was a really real world example that made sense. And then we did some data quality. It's like, well, we don't have the credit score for half our customers, so we can't base all of our pricing off credit score. Are there other factors? And what's really healthy discussion around what's, what's legal, what's ethical, what's allowed, what data quality we have. And by picking an actual example, it just made it really real to people. So the problem with governance, and maybe it's our own fault as an industry, we use big words for things and it seems overwhelming until you actually do it. And not to keep bringing up the example this morning at a client, but it was just so real. We were trying to say, you know, what, what would be an example of a term that didn't make sense? And it was that work week. And everyone's like, oh yeah, that would be, oh, yeah, if we could just get in a room and to solve that and get it documented, that makes sense. And you're going to have that old, own example. It can sound really crazy of, you know, something like, what what's a customer until you give an example we wouldn't sell to our wholesale customers or what about the customers that that it, we, we we've voided we don't work with anymore i just this morning got an email from a accountant i hadn't worked with in six years asking me to get my sales tax <laughs> i don't have sales tax and i haven't worked with you for six years but i was supposed to upload it to the portal made him look silly um because that was the wrong kind of customer i was a lapsed customer <laughs> right so all of that kind of thing um pick a small small problem or issue or opportunity or business question, get the right people in the room, solve it through um, a data model and a process model, and it'll make a lot of sense to people. And then rinse and repeat, right? Use that process for another question and get the right people in the room for that. And then people will start to see the value of these. You know, why do I need a data quality dashboard? That seems ridiculous. Well, you just sent out an email campaign to your customers and 80% of the emails are wrong and 20% are missing. So I don't think your emails are going to be effective. Oh, well, yeah, that would help me. Well, that's why you need a data quality dashboard, right? It just makes it really real for people. So uh, metadata is one of those other things that is such a nerdy word for such a helpful thing. Um, and I like to say what why the business folks often like it is it once you have it, it makes your governance actionable, right? You can have a policy and policies are great and I've written them and governance policies are needed, but it's just a piece of paper until you can actually implement it. And that's where things like data models and lineage and, and data privacy policies on the database, right? So I could say that, you know, no one but, no one but HR is allowed to see salaries of customers, of employees, sorry. Well, that's great. But are you actually implementing that on your warehouse or are you right? Right. So that's where the metadata around that about what fields do I need to hide and how do I, you know, or, or in my data model, do, am I am I showing that appropriately or you're know, right. So you can have a policy, but until it's actually made 
actionable in an architecture or uh, metadata, you know, it's it's just kind of theory, right? So they really, the both of those working together could be really helpful. And similarly, you don't want the architects and, and engineers building a database not knowing who can see salary and just taking a guess, right? So that's where the, the people and the technical part work together. So metadata, having said, it's a terrible word uh, for a really helpful term. I like to kind of say it's the who, what, where, why, and when of data, right? That um, and who created this data, what's the definitions, where is it stored, why are we storing it, you know, what's the usage, when was it created, when do we delete it, how is it formatted, how many databases are you using, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you break it down to these really simple questions, most people, especially on the business side, say, oh my gosh, how could we not have this? You don't know what this data means and <laughs> we're reporting off it, right? And more and more also on the technical side, what, what's the lineage? How do you think of things like um, California Privacy Act or GDPR? You, you need to know where this data is stored, your right to be forgotten and, and, and all of that. So it's becoming more and more important. Um, and just so easy, when you think about it, it's the who, what, where, why, when, and why of data, it just makes it a lot more easy to understand. Um, data models, if you've if you've seen me, heard me present before, you know I'm a fan. And I'm a fan because they work. And I'm, I hear less and less, you know, why do you need a data model? I don't know. Maybe I'm just working with the right people. But I, I just, what bothers me is that I've always had success with them. 90% of the time, you know, working with the business and with the, they just are very successful. So, um, but there's different levels. And I think sometimes when people say they're not successful, it might be. Um, you know, um, so um, so I'm just going to do a quick check, Shannon. You can still hear me and everything's good, right? I just got an internet issue. Yeah, you, 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 you flipped that for a second, but you're good. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I once gave a whole webinar thinking I was online and then five minutes and my internet connection had dropped and I talked to myself for an hour. <laughs> I'm always wary about that. Okay, so this 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 triangle kind of shows the levels of a data model. If you're a very large company or any company, some people just start with high level subject areas, right? This is the customer data and there would be 10 different types of entity or, or concepts in there. Um, it just helps with that high level scoping. Um, but generally, there's a conceptual data model that's going to be, you know, what's a customer, what's a product, what's a region, what's a, um, what's an employee, are, are interns considered employees or not, right? Those basic terms. Your logical data model is where you're going to start to get into some of those detailed business rules. Uh, can a customer have more than one account? Can a customer have more than one address? You know, all of that type of detail, that might be where your data stewards live. Um, and then your physical data model is going to kind of be your technical, you know, data engineers, DBAs, developers, sorts of things. Um, and, and picture's worth a thousand words. So, oh, it's not, yeah, the picture's worth a thousand words. So um, here's an example of a, a data model at kind of that conceptual level. Um, this particular tool I chose shows the definitions. So it's almost like a glossary on steroids, which is kind of nice. Um, and what I like about this is that most people, not even knowing what a data model is, you show them a few, um, you know, few little rules like, the thing that looks like a crow's foot there is it means many and the thing that looks like a zero means optional and you know people can pretty quickly start to engage with it and you might even start looking at well here an employee is a full or part-time worker on the active payroll wait a minute we don't consider a part-time person employee they would be something else right so you can start to discuss that right and there's different types of employees sales reps and support reps and support reps support customers but only your corporate customers have a sales rep or whatever, you can start to understand, uh, or someone might say, what do you mean customers? Are, isn't that a client? Is the client different from a customer, right? So you start to actually have some really healthy conversations. And I often do these in workshops, right? With whiteboarding and sticky notes, and things like that. Or in this new virtual age, it's a mirror board, right? And people are putting their own, you know, it could be, it should be interactive. It's not, if it's not interactive, we're not doing it right. Um, but and, and I think the value of a conceptual model is the questions it raises. And, and you can sound crazy in the amount of conversations I've had about something like, what is chocolate? Is the flavor of chocolate chocolate or is chocolate chocolate? Does chocolate have a chocolate flavor? I mean, that was a that was a workshop with one of our, um, you know, uh, clients that 
build food, right? So that made sense to them. But what is a client? What is a customer? It can sound crazy until it's your use case. And then it's absolutely critical to your business. They may be completely different business models, right? And you need to flesh that out in the conceptual layer. Logical model is where you're starting to get into those more business rules, right? Um, you know, what's what's a, a product and how are parts you know, defined? Is it a raw material, finished goods, subassembly, et cetera? What are the different attributes or your critical data elements might sit there? Um, again, it can seem kind of nerdy and boring, but we've, you know, I, we had a whole conversation of, you know, they had, uh, one company had outsourced some data modeling and, and data quality, and they came back with the biggest issue they found that, you know, fax number wasn't populated. And you know, I think one of the younger folks was like, what's a fax? And why why on earth would we even have a fax number, right? So that can be a really healthy, healthy conversation um, through something like a, a logical data model. And then your physical data model, that is where you're going to start to create some of these data structures. This is where your standard data types, um, you know, optimizing for performance and things like that. But the, even this, you know, it can sound techie. Do we really need to do this for governance? Absolutely. Do we have standard naming? You know, is it our dimensions in a warehouse always dim underscore, right? Otherwise it becomes a mess or, you know, actual business impact. We had one unnamed client and I'm still, still not sure why someone would have done this, but you know, the standard length of the product ID, I think was 10 characters. And then their data engineer at the time decided to shorten it to eight for some reason, brought down their website, crashed the company. They lost two days of sales over something like a data type length, right? So that could have been solved by governance. Actually, after that, sales actually pushed for governance because they didn't get them, right? Their, their website went down. And it seems very odd that sales was saying, we now need data modeling standards and data type standards, but it was because there was an actual business impact on that one. Data quality is something else that's a really good mix of people data governance and technical data governance. Um, and we could do a whole, actually we are later in the year doing a whole webinar on something like data quality. Uh, but why it's a great business conversation is, is that it's nuanced. What does it even mean that is this data right? So it's something simple on a technical side. Could Is it there or is it not? Is it complete? Is it null? Well, maybe it's okay to be null. Again, that idea of a fax number, maybe that's fine. Um, but is it consistent? Or what is that? Can, can tech define whether it's consistent or is it conf or is it accurate? For example, this 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 address could be a correctly formatted address, but it's not Joe's address. Only the sales rep knows Joe's really address, right? Or or reasonable. Um, we had one, and it was a school, right? So they didn't have they shouldn't have had any students over their age of eighteen. Um, and so you could have an, a, a date, a birth date, and it could be reasonable, but it could be like zero, 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 right? That, that's not, or one, 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 one. That's not a, a valid date for their birth dates for their students, right? Um, or I'm a AARP. I probably shouldn't have anyone below the age of 60 or something, right? So uh, is it a reason? It could be a valid value, but is it reasonable? So this is a really great way for both business and IT, IT or tech or architects, right? Architects can can create some, or the technical data management can create data quality rules, profiling dashboards, but the business is the only one that can say, is that a reasonable value for our business? Because business people get, get their business, they understand. So th that's where some of those business rules can be included. Um, and again, quality in particular, is one of these that takes a good holistic approach, right? The people, the, the, the data governance, they're gonna create the business rules for what good looks like. The tech folks can create data management, they can create data quality dashboards and things like that. Um, but there may be a business process change. If, if it's a school and we're putting in birthdays that make people 100 years old, who's putting that in? Do the people registering the students put that in? Is it the teachers that put that in? The kid, The kids, the students themselves put that in? How do we fix that? Could be a business process issue, which can be managed through governance, right? So, um, you know, are there drop down lists we can put in that only have, you know, a certain date range if that's what we need, or valid values for state codes, et cetera? One of my, I find it funny, uh, but I registered once for a data quality re webinar at a an un unnamed <laughs> institution, um, and and, it, and the. The state, you know, I live in Colorado. The state was a free form text field. I was like, oh, as a data management person, why couldn't that be a drop down with all 50 U.S. states if my country was the U.S., right? So, you know, some simple things from a tech 
point of view can really help with data quality, make it easy on people to do the right thing. Um, or, you know, your school in Michigan and 99.9% .9 or 100% of your students are all in Michigan, make the drop, don't even have a drop down default to Michigan or something like that, right? So, um, right. So, I, I mean, I think with data quality, that's yet another example of a great intersection of people, process, governance, all working together. Tools and platforms always come up, and I told you in the beginning, I love to hate them, <laughs> right? That um, you don't want to start there. You absolutely need tools, but the, the lo a lot of reasons for starting your data governance and your data architecture process with minimal tools and getting the people, getting the, the needs together, because there is no one size fits all. Um, and what makes it even more complicated is because all of this stuff is hot in the industry today, there's a lot of overlap and functionality that can be really confusing. A data quality tool, a data catalog can have some data quality functionality. A master data management tool can have some data quality. A master data tool can have some data modeling and a little bit of catalog, right? So I think it's a great idea to, to get your governance started, list what functionality you need. And this is just one way we did it, no golden way to do this, but yeah, I need a data governance organization. Is that a big business need? And, we, and this is a fictitious, well, anonymized one we did. It was a strong business need to have a data governance organization. Do I need a tool for that? That would be the tech importance. There are some tools out there that help you with your org, but you could, and, and PowerPoint's a tool, but you could create your data governance organization through Word docs and PowerPoint. Maybe that's fine. And business process and workflow. That was a big part for this client, getting the process right. There are process modeling tools out there. There's business process automation. But for them, that was a high business need, but not so much. You didn't need a tool for that, right? But something like, um, I don't know, metadata management and creating an inventory. There was For this client, there was a high compliance need, right? So, um, you know, trying to create an inventory of all of your PII or all of your data fields and doing that manually feels like a torture device for somebody because a lot of these data catalogs can absolutely you know, scan that in and, and even do, you know, tagging to say, okay, this looks like PII or here's an inventory of all my systems. So that was a good example of there was a high business seed and also a high technical need, right? So business glossary is a great example you could do a glossary in an Excel spreadsheet or uh, maybe upgrade to a, you know, not to only pick Microsoft, but a, you know, a SharePoint list. Um, but some folks that wouldn't be enough. You wouldn't get the buy-in of the business. So that one, I think absolutely depends on the company, right? Plenty of folks I work with have a very successful glossary on something very low tech. Some folks, business wouldn't use it unless it was flashy enough or we had the right workflow associated with it. So for this particular client, it was a high business need, but they also wanted really good technology um, to get the business bought in. So if you looked at kind of that um, chart at the bottom where it played out of where they might need to buy a tool for them, it was a metadata management tool that could do some inventory and have a really good glossary, maybe some lineage, uh, maybe some quality, right? So that helped them of all the tools they needed to buy, um, probably one that was a good data catalog with a good glossary and data lineage. That was them. Right. It could have been that, you know, our biggest thing is, is data architecture. And we need a modeling tool or maybe it's data privacy or it could be all of the above. But it really kind of helps of all the things you need for your particular environment. What might be solved through a tool and what can you save your money for? Uh, I'm a big fan to maybe start with some of the, um, you know, the, the infrastructure first before you understand the tool. Um, just leaving, leaving you with a final uh, story, because it always helps to put this in the real world. Um, uh, this is a, uh, if you go back to that example I showed of, of building out your architecture and examples that get that light bulb to go off for folks that, okay, this is what you mean by why we need a data model or an architecture or a glossary. So this is a retail company. This was an actual, the same company that actually had the issue where they shortened the, uh, <laughs> shortened the product number field and brought down their website. But the, the other issue they had, this was a very high end, uh, product and a lot of, really positive customer word of mouth, um, et cetera. But typically people went into the showroom and looked at the product and the, the sales rep would say, what's your address, email address. And uh, if you're like me, you probably said, go away at stupid.com for my email address. Um, but generally people bought the product. It might be their second or third time they've bought this product. Um, and at some point they wanted it delivered, but they needed customer support. And then at that point they put in their correct email address because I want to know where my product is. 
problem is they didn't have good master data management. And by the time they got this very expensive product, they couldn't get the traffic. They'd call customer support and they were great customer support. And they said, we want to make this work for you, Mr. Smith. What's your, and, they, and the people were angry. They said, you should know better. I already gave you the email, right? Um, and then because they didn't have the email, they couldn't, they were actually doing amazing things with, you know, it was an IOT enabled product uses tracking what features they have and that would get fed back into product development, but they couldn't even get that email. So what we did, started a little mini data governance, data architecture project. It lasted literally a month where we got sales and marketing and customer support and product. And we just said, what's the life cycle? Tell me the story around where an email goes. And, and we did an architecture diagram. We did a data model. We did, um, you know, stewardship. And basically we were able to show and, and uh, marketing loved it. Cause she goes, now I know why I can get the right email for my campaigns and customer support loved it. And they, and they basically said, I never would have thought I would use a data flow diagram, but it helps show where, how, how the data flowed. And we solved a problem and, and folks understood why they were in the room. We solved something and we moved on. And over time they built out the full diagrams and all of that, but it got that light bulb to go on of getting people together and understanding getting the architecture right and the definitions right and all of that um, really had a business effect. And, and then they moved on from there. Okay, so in, in summary, data governance is both business and technical. It's a both and. Um, and so architecture and governance should really work together because it takes a village of roles. Um, and, and sometimes it's a process or a workflow issue and tools are enabler and you should definitely have some, uh, but they're not the total solution. And I wouldn't recommend starting there with the tools um, they should enable. So uh, before we open it up to QA, uh, there is again, a full a full year of these. Um, next month, I, I think I mentioned in the beginning of this that often the data governance lead might turn into a, a chief data officer and chief data officer is still a very hot role. Uh, so we're gonna talk, uh, kind of drill into what that role means and how that can really support something like business transformation. So hopefully you can join us there. Um, my company does this for a living. So if you need help, don't hesitate to let us know. My email is in the second slide. Um, and with that, I will open it up to Shannon for some questions. Donna, thank you so much as always for another great webinar. If you have questions for Donna, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. Everyone's pretty quiet today, Donna. Um, I think this might be a first. I know, right? Well, I I think that um, maybe everyone's having a week like ours where it's just been insane. <laughs> and just oh, like a little mental right. break. <laughs> I was kind of laughing, though, through the presentation. We've started our own discussions on, you know, what's a subscriber? What's, you know, you know, I love it when we're when we are struggling with the same thing that everybody else is right that we're teaching and going over. And it, it's it's a hard thing to well, do. Yeah, what's interesting, and I mean, maybe to kind of flip into the the, the next uh, months, which is the the role of a CDO, a data officer in business transformation. We had that a similar conversation with it was a um actually a, a company just like your similar to yours, and they only did in person events, right? And and mm -hmm. then with COVID, they said, "Ooh, what what's an event? Could an event be virtual for them? For you folks, you've been doing that forever." And then they're like. What is even an event? Is a blog an event? Like, how do we engage our people? So the, the data model actually became a business that really transformed the way they thought about their business of something as simple as what is an event and what is an interaction and what is a customer? And since then, they've really changed their business model over something as simple. That's what I mean by an event, right? So. Yeah, Excellent. yeah, it changes everything once you have those conversations. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got some great questions coming in now. Um. Donna, do you have any suggestions for skills or experiences to build up your career advancement in data governance? Well, I would be remiss if I didn't say go to data diversity. <laughs> Word from the sponsor. Um, ooh, uh, so again, it depends because there, there's a wide range. But if you're looking to be a data governance lead, if we start there, um, I think being Dama Diembach certified is good because I think that gives you a, a wide range, the data management body of knowledge. I I don't know if this is a popular opinion, but for me, I think even something like PMP or, or project management certification, because I think a lot of those skills of how to herd the cats and be organized, right? Um, and then maybe a little deeper dive into some, like some of the things that, you know, like a data modeling or data quality, 
that are a little more on the businessy side might not be a bad idea or metadata management to, to kind of go deep into some of those things because sometimes those sit in the data governance organizations. So hopefully that gives you some areas to start. If you're in the data architecture space, I think, you know, getting more deep dive into some of those skills like data modeling or data profiling or you know, data quality could definitely help. Agreed. I love the shout out. So, you know, I can't complain there. <laughs> <laughs> so you just and, let me the $5 later. <laughs> <laughs> so Donna, how would you measure the success of a data governance initiative? Oh, great question. Um, I think, you know, it, it, throughout the presentation, I kind of mentioned, you know, role is what getting the business folks involved and in, I think picking a business problem and solving them is the best way to show success right uh, you'll always be asked for metrics but I think the more it's just working you're not going to be asked as much for prove your value because people just see it right so you know the example Shannon gave like this is actually affecting our business so I think that, you know that there's what do you call it? Metrics. And then there's anecdotes. And I think I'm a, I'm a data person, so I'm going to get struck by lightning saying this. But some of those anecdotes are when people feel that it worked. Or you made my life easier or you solved this problem through governance. I would get a lot of those under your belt. Um, and and then, then, of course, some, some metrics of how engaged are people with this this content. But the more, you know, uh, where I sometimes see data governance fail is the, the metrics are only, you know, we have 400 data elements in our catalog but you're missing the so what, right? So the more you can link those data quality metrics with some sort of business metric, like um, we improve the quality of our email addresses and campaign performance went up by 20%, like pick some of those softballs that people can actually see the value of what you're doing. Um, I think are great ways to kind of show some of the metrics around data governance, if that makes sense. It does. Uh and Donna, how would one employee governance, how would one employ governance in a data mesh, for example, decentralized, federated for data as a product? Um, so I, I think the, the idea of, of data mesh and the governance isn't too far from any architecture, right? The idea of a mesh is get some ownership of things locally, right? So finance is going to understand finance's data or HR is going to understand and maybe finance has financial data products. Um, doesn't always work. I don't always say the mess for everybody, but but that I uh, there's different models of, of how you pick your stewards. You know, it, it, do I pick my data stewards or by org or by, and I think that fits nicely with match, right? I'm going to pick the finance folks to be the finance data stewards to understand the finance data product, you, you, you know, to under because they're going to understand the financial rules, right? And HR should be the ones that define the data around. So I think kind of having that org focused view, if that's how you're doing your mesh makes sense. I think, you know, the part of the mesh um, that you want to stress too, and isn't stressed enough, I think, in some things I've seen is you also want that cross-functional because there's some core enterprise, like your master data, right? If that you know, even HR shouldn't only define employee because employee might also be with finance because the employees get a bonus or HR, right? So, um, or you know, sales, right? Because sales gets a commission and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So or customer service might want to have an employee input or, or how they're tracked, right? So I think doing governance by the, or, or, or by the different nodes of your mesh makes a lot of sense, but don't forget to also have that cross-functional where, where that makes sense. So you don't you don't want to create silos, right? So I think having a mix of oh, product owners where it makes sense, but for the cross-functional stuff, everybody has a voice. So you don't you know recreate the problem we've been trying to solve, which for years, which is which is silos. A problem for many. So, um. Donna, when is a good percentage range of total revenue to spend on data governance? Wow, that's a hard one. Um, I hope that wasn't asked by your boss. Um, hmm, well, that, ugh, that's a hard one. I don't think I can give a hard and fast number. I think as minimal as possible because you'll always be asked. I think the more you show the value, you're going to be asked less to, on the revenue. Um, and, oh gosh, that depends. I mean, it's hard. Also, how you? I mean, often I get the you know, how much time do business people need to spend, right? And then how much um, that should be. You know, it does not take as that as long as people think. Um, I I would say scale it over time, right? Because 
you know, th there's the data governance team and you do need to hire, I would say, a data governance lead and then maybe a data architect, but you need the full, you know, team, I would say, search value over time. But yeah, I don't think there's an actual magic number. I'd probably want to talk to you and, kind of, you know, we can come up with that number, but it's not like there's a magic one for each industry, but you're often seen as a cost center. So just be careful, you know, shouldn't be half your revenue, obviously. So think that through. So sorry, I couldn't give you a better answer. There's, there's no magic number for that one. I wish there were. It'd make life so much easier, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, lots of great questions too coming in in the chat here. Um, uh, when an organization wants to focus on data governance, should it initially be introduced as a program? Initially be introduced as a program. I, I, I think data governance, so if, if that's a new term, so I, I think what the person's getting at, there's programs that go on forever and projects which have a beginning and an end. Um, I, I definitely think data governance is a program. And I, I've been, you know, I, I actually was sharing a success story. We've been with one client for eight years in their data governance journey. And someone said, oh, eight years and they're not done yet. And I'm like, well, that's the wrong way to see it. It's like, you don't say finance. Oh, you're not done with finance. You haven't got rid of your finance or HR. Or what you're not done with HR. Um, so I think data got, it's like weight loss. You don't go on a diet and then stop. It's a way of life. It's a way of living. It's a way of doing things, right? So um, that said, I often say start with a project. You might not want to, you know, if it's absolutely new and people don't get it, I often say start with a project. Um, or even if it is a program, start with a series of projects that build towards the whole um, so yeah, I think it is a program, but very often you want to start with a single project to get that light. I, I've overused that term, getting the light bulb going on, but it's true. It's like people don't get governance until they do it and then they love it. Cause like, oh, that, that's what I wanted. I, this governance thing sounded scary. So often starting with a project approach, but don't end there. You don't end governance is going to be around forever. So it's a program. All right. And Donna, what impact can data governance have to um, the speed of business operations? Oh, great question. Um, because it, it's, it will make it faster. <laughs> it makes things easier um, in general. And, and it's the negative um, stereotype we sort of get is it's going to slow things down. I mean, maybe in the beginning, but you have to slow down to speed up, right? And generally we come, we often make, when, when we're helping sell governance, it's an efficiency play. If you're spending all this time finding the data, right? Or we're making bad decisions off the data because it wasn't right, right? And, and often the biggest proponent when we're trying to sell data in an organization are people that came from another organization and it was working. They're like, folks, you don't understand. All this like pain and suffering you're going through can be made so much easier and be streamlined if you had governance in place. And that's often the easiest way to sell governance is that efficiency. It just makes everyone's life easier generally over time. Indeed. Uh, so many great questions that have been coming in. So what is the significant difference, Donna, between Data Lake, Data Warehouse, and Data Mart? Um, I'll give you the simple, uh, quick two-minute one. Um, so I would say a Data Lake is when you land the data in raw format, whether it's structured or unstructured. Um, and then you're, you're going to transform that into a, a warehouse, which I would say what whatever you know could be a dimensional or could even be relational. But the idea is that it's structured, it's conformed, and generally it's reporting over time, it, you're trending, which might be different from an operational data store, which is real time or whatever, but that that's the, you know, Lake is just the raw data, often data scientists like that, but the, the data warehouse is conformed and, and trending over time. And then Marts might be, you know, maybe I have my enterprise data warehouse, but, you know, HR might be a good example. All the stuff about salary and, you know, candidate profiling and stuff not only is it sensitive but no one else really cares so that might be kind of a little cousin of the warehouse that's a mart though some of the dimensions like employee might be shared but you might have your own mart hope that hope that two minute example made sense uh, but feel free to follow up if you have questions perfect um Oh, we still got to, like, I'm just, I'm wondering if I can slip this in here. You know, we got a little less than two minutes oh, here, let's, or a let's minute. Live large. Let's try it. <laughs> How do you explain data, such as data used in a simple business spreadsheet or in uh, Microsoft Power Apps, to individual that has an enterprise perspective, the big data versus the small data? Where does that fit into data governance and data architecture? Okay, you're right. That is a big one to answer in it's a minute. A um, <laughs> I would just say, I mean, uh, what... 
Well, here's a maybe an analogy I often use because um, I had one client that said, you know, we do not deal with structured, unstructured data. We only govern structured data and databases. And I'm like, well, if if someone's, you know, social security number was compromised and you say it's OK because it was in a PDF, look, I think someone doesn't care. Right. You still stole my social security number and sold it on the dark web. Right. So I think governance look, governance by the business needs to be holistic. And then you then you worry about whether it's a sprint. So maybe using some examples like, like like data is our customer information. Data is our product. You know, that's often a big one. You know, our product hierarchies, I don't care where, if it's in a spreadsheet uh, or in a, you know, a PIM or PLM system, it's still our product data. So I would start from that way. And then yes, it's all of those, but I think that'll help also organize and prioritize because you can't govern it all, but to pick, you know, the key stuff that's going to have impact. Did I make it into a minute? I think did. I did. But, all right. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. That is all the time we have, I'm afraid. But uh, thanks for being so engaged and coming up with all the great questions. And Donna, thanks again, as always, for a great presentation. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, thank Donna. Thank you. Bye-bye.